Hi everyone. Welcome to tonight's meeting of the Port Phillip City Council, which is being held via the WebEx platform and we're hoping maybe for the last time for a while, um, but it's being streamed via Council's webcast page and Facebook Live. The City of Port Phillip respectfully acknowledges the traditional owners of the lands we meet from today. We pay our respects to their elders, both past and present. We acknowledge and uphold their continuing relationship to this land. So as per usual, there could be some uh, technical issues with this online meeting. Um, if they happen to occur, we'll adjourn and try to fix them. And if they continue, we will adjourn the meeting for a uh, and let you know of the, the next time and date as soon as we can. All submissions from members of the public will be heard at the start of the meeting. And additionally, voting on all motions will be under division where the chair will call upon councillors individually in rotating alphabetical order to state their vote. I do remind all attendees that anyone participating in tonight's meeting must extend due courtesy and respect to council and the processes under which it operates and must take direction from the chair whenever called on to do so. Speakers must remain respectful and statements or questions must not be defamatory, offensive or objectionable, aimed at embarrassing a councillor or a member of council staff or relate to a matter outside the power of council. So well, let's get started. Uh, Agenda item number one is apologies, councillors. Do we have any apologies? Unless there's any last minute dropouts? No. Uh, two, the minutes of previous meetings. So, councillors, these minutes were circulated from the ordinary meeting held on the 6th of October 2021. Are there any questions uh, regarding these minutes? If not, I've got a mover. Thank you, Councillor Martin. And do I have a seconder? Councillor Baxter, uh, I'm just going to put that straight to the vote then. Uh, Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Sirikoff. Four. The motion is carried unanimously. Item number three is declarations of conflicts of interest. Councillors, do, does anyone have a, a conflict of interest they'd like to declare in regards to tonight's matters? No, moving on to public question time and submissions. So we will now hear all of the public questions and comments on report items from members of the public and all requests were required to be submitted by 4 p.m. this afternoon. There are a large number of speakers because we have, as I say regularly, a very engaged community. So I am going to ask you to uh, keep your speeches short and sweet and I am going to ask you to limit it to two minutes. I will be a little bit flexible at the end, but two minutes is your speaking time, which is harder for the first speakers, but the speakers beyond, if you could please start adjusting your notes um, because we've got a lot of you to hear from. So first cab off the rank tonight, uh, asking a public question is Andrew McGregor. Are you there, Andrew? I am here, yes. Hi, Andrew. Before you uh, speak for your two minutes, could you just state your name and suburb and then please start? Okay, good evening, Council. My name is Andrew McGregor. I am in North Coburg of Melbourne. I appreciate you taking the time to listen to me, uh, Mayor, uh, Deputy Mayor, Councillors. Um, I just would like to uh, raise a, a question. I did send an email. I'd just like to raise a question regarding um, signage uh, within the municipality of uh, Port Phillip. Uh, I am director at Pluckett, proprietor at Pluckett. Uh, Pluckett has a commercial relationship with uh, Port Phillip City Council. Pluckett's provided outdoor advertising for the cultural sector. Uh, we're trying to legalise the bill poster, have been working away at this for 20 years. Um, at, there was a particular site uh, which had got uh, received some attention from planning uh, compliance officers. Um, and it's, I understand that planning uh, within Port Phillip have decided to, have requested that uh, I remove any signage without planning, the necessary planning permission. Uh, this is going to be a, a, a bit of a problem because um, Pluckett has tried to establish a, uh, an approved medium for the cultural sector to advertise. Um, at, this request was issued on the 7th of October. Uh, I've got 14 days and basically until tomorrow to remove all that signage um, uh, to be able to then go through and to apply for planning. Um, we've got a few campaigns coming up, Pluckett Support Music Arts and Entertainment. 
Um, and I just want to see if Council are aware of uh, these requests and the implications that that will have on the cultural sector to be able to advertise within the municipality, uh, and that is Council as well. Currently, we're working on various campaigns for Linden Arts. Uh, we've worked with uh, Port Phillip on many a campaign in the past. Uh, we're in dialogue with them about the St Kilda 22 Festival, uh, which we're a, a sponsor or looking to be a sponsor, which we've been in the past. Um, so there's a range of, uh, I guess, outdoor signage, which we've done. Um, in effect, we've, there used to be a status quo of people bill posting. What Pluckett has tried to do is gain approval from the owner, uh, tidy up areas to be able to create a legal avenue um, which you'll, you'll see around the place. So uh, this is going to cause some big problems within uh, the business and for the greater cultural community to be able to advertise their wares in the municipality. All right, Andrew, that is past your two minutes. So I might go to an officer to respond to your thank question you. and issue. Uh, Brian T. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor, and through you, Mayor. Um, advertising posters of um, this, nature are, this nature are subject to uh, planning controls depending on the site or the land parcel on which the signage is to be erected. Um, there are various zones or overlays uh, which determine whether a permit is required. Um, these are in place to ensure safety and protect the amenity and heritage of the uh, City of Port Phillip. Um, Mr McGregor has asked um, in his uh, written submission where uh, he can uh, advertise or where the cultural sector can advertise and he, he also um, would like um, to work with uh, council to present um, a way forward to council. Uh, the cultural sector plays uh, and makes an enormous contribution to our municipality and our planning team would be happy to discuss uh, Mr McGregor's proposals. Uh, we'd be happy to work with Mr McGregor to assist his business uh, to apply for the appropriate permits. Oh, great, Brian. So obviously you've got Andrew's uh, details. So thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Brian. Next, I'm going to call upon Fiona Brindle, who is also submitting a question to Council. Hi, Fiona. Uh, good afternoon, councillors. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, my name's Fiona Brindle from Port Melbourne. Fantastic. Um, I have a request in relation to off-the-leash dog areas, um, especially during summer. Um, Port Phillip Council registration statistics um, show that dog registrations have increased by almost 20% in the last two years. And we have, um, well, I've yet to see any increase in off-the-leash dog areas. So I was wondering if there could be um, more beach areas made accessible throughout the entire year rather than closing down particular beaches. And if that's not possible, to have uh, times um, similar to the, those that are allotted to Middle Park and to Elwood Beach, where there are restrictions on the times that dogs can access the beaches. That's it from me. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, Brian T, would you like to respond? Um, yes, thank you. And through you, um, Mayor. Um, I can confirm that there has been a 20% increase in the number of registered dogs in the past two years um, and that council, we do try and balance the needs of dog owners with other uh, users of open space, um, but balancing, getting this balance right and finding solutions uh, can be challenging, particularly in our uh, inner city environment. Uh, council is providing for the increased uh, dog numbers through the development of a park at uh, more in reserve and through fencing some off leach areas along the light rail in Port Melbourne to make them safer for dogs. We also have a draft public space strategy which is looking to investigate opportunities for new off leash areas um, and this will also guide how we get that balance right. Uh, we also have a petition which is being considered on the 3rd of November. Um, which uh, is considering other changes to um, dog uh, access and dog restrictions on our beaches. Um, 
uh, Ms Brindle in her written material says she's got um, some suggestions in terms of increasing um, spaces and we'd be very pleased to hear um, from Ms Brindle uh, um, initially through our animal, animal man management unit which can be um, accessed through our web. Thank you. Uh, I now call on Patricia Goldie also submitting a question to Council. Hi Patricia. Patricia Goldie, Port Melbourne, thank you. Thank you. I, I own several dogs when my family was growing up. I'm older and have some orthopaedic problems like many of my age and can, can no longer manage a dog. But I do enjoy walking on the beaches of Port Phillip most of the time. The problem is I often do not feel safe on the beaches when dogs are off leash. This is because many dog owners, not all, do not have their dog under effective control. Council regulations state that the dog will return to you on command. The dog does not bother, attack, worry or interfere with other people or animals. The owner retains a clear and unobstructed view of the dog. I wish, if only this was happening, Adherence to this regulation is poor by many dog owners on Port Phillip beaches. This is confirmed by 96 dog attacks in 2021 with 10 successful prosecutions for serious injury and 255 animal management requests for dog not under control. This is evidence of why it is frightening to be on the beach with off-leash dogs for many non-dog owners. This includes children, people with physical and intellectual disabilities, seniors, and just healthy, normal people. These people want the right to exercise, have a swim, relax, have a picnic, play games on the beaches without being bothered by, and it does not happen. Uh, I've actually had um, two frightening incidents myself, which I reported, but that doesn't help you when the next time happens down on the beach and there's no one around. Um, and often there's aggressive behaviour by the dog owners. A lot of the dog owners are very nice and responsible, but there are some very aggressive ones. The it's obvious Patricia. solution to this problem is to make a few beaches dog on leash in off-peak season. Right. Do you want me to go to my question now? Yes, if you may, if you could, please, Patricia. I just have one more sentence and I'll go to my question. Is yes. that okay? Yes. Uh, and I think this dog on leash solution would be really good in the off-peak season and to a lesser extent in peak season and by changing the regulation that way you will have happy dog owners and you will have, have happy non-dog owners and we will feel safe. So now to my question and I've skipped a whole lot of my talk. The council officer recommendations for the draft damp plan July 2021 did not include any changes to dog regulations on the beaches of Port Phillip. Since adherence to the regulations for off-leash dogs on the beaches is so serious in Port Phillip, why has the petition put before council at the meeting only two weeks ago suddenly been included for consideration for the Domestic Animal Plan 2225 at such a late stage after the damp consultation process had closed and without any input or due consultation with the wider community. When I asked to put in a late submission, I was told it was too late. Thank you. Thank you. Brian T. Um, thank you, Mayor, and through you. Uh, Ms Goldie's question deals with um, her concern that the petition before Council dealing with dogs on beaches will be included as part of Council's consideration of the domestic animal plan, um, the DAMP. Um, there are two separate matters before Council. There is uh, Council's proposed domestic animal management plan and separately the petition uh, received on 6 October dealing with dog restrictions on Port Melbourne beaches. In response to uh, Ms Goldie's question, I can indicate that on 3 November, Council is scheduled to consider both the petition and the domestic animal management plan. I can assure uh, Ms Goldie, that it is not intended to include any changes to dog restrictions in any location as part of that domestic animal management plan. Um, but it should be noted that Council may, as part of its consideration of the petition dealing with dog uh, restrictions on beaches, uh, Council may consider changes to 
dog restrictions on those beaches on that night. Thank you. Now I call upon Elizabeth Morrison submitting a question to Council. Elizabeth? Yes, good evening. Elizabeth, um, you can my state name your Elizabeth name. Morrison. And your suburb? Hello. Port Melbourne. Great, please. I have away. a question too about mm -hmm. the um, Titian and about Dam. Um, with any consideration of change to beach access for dog owners, um, I think it should be considered. You know, I'm wondering how much we know about um, the current off leash and dog prohibited or on leash parks that are in Port Melbourne and close to the beach. Because there's a lot of areas where dogs are able to be off leash already, and these areas are quite close to the beach. Um, Gas Works, Lagoon Park, uh, Garden City Reserve, and further away, Murphy Reserve. All of these areas are off leash, and they're areas where dog owners can exercise their dog. Um, so my question is, um, what are the current off leash and dog prohibited or on leash park areas in Port Melbourne? I'd like to be able to compare the two. Great. I'm sorry, okay. I've, I've had an eye appointment this afternoon and I can't see anything. So. That's all right. That's your I've main question. Drops, I, ah, I yeah. hope that they get better. Um, but that's your main question. So I'll go to Brian T to see if we can answer that one for you. Um, thank you, um, Mayor, and through you. The current off dog parks in Port Melbourne are at Lagoon Reserve, uh, Gasworks Park, Garden City Reserve, JL Murphy, um, and one half of reserves along the light rail at, at Station Street. All other parks are on lead, uh, and there are no parks where dogs are prohibited. Uh, the locations of our dog off lead areas are shown on a map on the Council's webpage under the heading Dogs uh, and Beaches. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I call upon Susan Goodman speaking to item 7.1, which is the petition for safety issues on Linton Street, Balakaba. Hi, Susan. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, you're a bit muffled. Uh, are you out in the wind? I am, sorry, I'm just trying to race home. Um, can okay. someone, uh, can I go, can I go no, in No, no, we second? can hear you better okay. now. We can. We can hear you better okay. now. It's, Susan, if you'd like to state your name and suburb and then you've got two minutes to speak. Perfect. Um, my name is Susan Goodman and I'm from Balaclava. Um, I believe that everyone received our petition. Um, we sent it in August just um, in regards to our concerns on Linton um, Street. It, it's, we've got, it's part of a lovely street. There's lots of kids of mixed ages, but unfortunately the footpaths um, are rather bumpy. Um, and even with prams and, you know, with kids riding scooters, you often end up telling them it's best to go onto the road, which is less than ideal just because it's quite dangerous. Um, there's also trees that um, unfortunately seem to gravitate to lots of possums um, coming. And with that comes, unfortunately, lots of possum poo, which also is a hazard. Um, and our street has concern over kind of impact of that with our kids as well. So what um, we just were looking at, but hopefully you could review the petition that most of our streets signed and that you could look into um, whether we could adjust the footpaths and the trees um, in our streets. I think Thanks. that's all yeah, I had to have. Great. Thank you very much, Susan. Thank you. Now we're also going to, I'm going to call upon Robert Ganji speaking to item 7.1, also the safety issues on Linton Street, Balaclava. Hi, Robert. Hi, Robert Ganji from Balaclava. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, councillors, for taking the time to hear our grievances. Um, further to Susan's uh, comments, uh, I'd like to reiterate that there's, we love our street, we love greenery. Um, but we just don't think the paper barks are fit, are fit for purpose on this street. Um, as Susan mentioned, it makes the footpath quite dangerous to walk on, to scoot on. Uh, our daughter has fallen over a few times. Um, and as she mentioned, there's, it's home for quite a you know, number of possums. Uh, there's numerous times that you can't park under trees because 
in the morning you wake up and there's po possum excrement everywhere. There's possum excrement all over the footpaths uh, and it makes the street quite unpleasant. Uh, we're not asking for a complete removal of trees. All we're doing is if we could have a discussion about maybe replacing the trees with something like an ornamental pear. Um, and I think that will make our street much more livable and much more friendly for both, you know, not us, only us adults, but the elderly and also our young children. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Uh, I call upon Alison Browning now, speaking to item 7.2, which is the petition requesting warm water outside showers at Port Melbourne Life Saving Club. Alison, are you with us? I am, yes. Hi, Alison. If you could state your name and suburb and then you've got sure. two minutes to speak. I'll be brief. My name's Sorry. Alison Browning. I'm in Brunswick. My pronouns are she and her. I am a mental health clinician working in private practice and for a national mental health org. I started swimming at Port Melbourne in February this year after struggling through the first lockdown last year while working in mental health supporting others. My GP provided me with an exemption to maintain my own self-support by travelling beyond my 5Ks to swim in the bay throughout winter and beyond. I'm a single person. I live alone. My experience of swimming at Port Melbourne drew me into a community that has been supportive beyond any expectation I could have had. I've been since involved in local beach cleanups and community activities linked to the swimming community and I feel more socially connected than I ever have before. Um, the benefits of year-round swimming are really heavily documented in research. It supports anxiety and autonomic nervous system regulation. Um, but to my point, I've learned to modify my schedule to allow extra time to get to the bay and back home to shower and then to get ready for work. So it means I don't always swim as much as I'd like to or need to. Having warm showers at Port Melbourne Beach um, by the Surf Club will allow this to be more practical for more people, allowing us to head to work after a morning swim, which is the most popular time at Port Melbourne. They'd allow us to warm up faster and get ready for work, making it a far more practical to do daily, ultimately attracting more people because it'll be a very doable activity before work. And hopefully it'll bring more people into our very active swimming community. So my, my comments really are in um, relation to the petition that Ross has submitted about the uh, Port Melbourne um, warm water showers being installed. Thank you. Thanks, Alison. Uh, I call upon Louise Manka speaking to item 7.2, which is the request for warm water outside showers at Port Melbourne Life Saving Clubs. Hi, Louise. Hi, how are you? Um, Louise Manka from Port Melbourne. Um, I've been involved with the Icebergers group um, for two years and um, covering many of the points that Ali has just commented on as well. I, I work um, organising a national mentoring program at the moment and so, and over many years have worked uh, you know, within social inclusion, diverse, diversity and equity sector. So very well aware of those principles. Um, also have a wealth, health and wellbeing background and, and science. Um, so I've got a really good understanding of the physical, social and mental benefits of um, cold water swimming. You know, some people um, do it for exercise, some for social and some for those cold water benefits. But over time, kind of all three combine and it's a very addictive pastime and has built um, these enduring relationships um, and rebuilt the community in Port Melbourne like, you know, just didn't exist before COVID. Interestingly, so many people say the negatives, it's one of the very big positives. It's probably one of the best examples I've seen of, you know, bringing people together and, and the group has grown so much, you couldn't actually design a better model of community inclusion. Um, and that's very much um, thanks to the efforts of both Ross and Ramona who were involved in many other um, um, activities as well. Um, and so, you know, look, while it may, may seem that it's, you know, meeting this a small interest group's need, I have no doubt that they would be more widely used if they existed um, and support Ali's um, comment as well that, you know, those people who have been involved in the cold water swimming, these enduring relationships will be able to continue if people were able to access warm showers and get dressed before work and head off to work because really with COVID it's saved us all this time um, and that's going to be impacted um, if we, if um, if we're unable to get dressed before we go to work. So um, thank you for listening. Thank you, Louise. On a theme here, uh, I'm going to call upon Ross Hedefin speaking to the request for warm water showers outside of Port Melbourne Life Saving Club. Hi, Ross. Hi, Mayor. How, how are you doing tonight? Good. How are you? Yeah, good. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to 
to talk on this petition. Just wanted to um, point, point out that you know um, the area for swimming around the Port Melbourne Lifesaving Club has grown cons- considerably over the last two years, particularly due to lockdown and a lot of those people saying, "Oh, I never knew ocean swimming was so good, and I'm not, I'm not going to go back to the, the pool anymore." And they they love the swimming uh, swimming in the the bay there from pole, pole, pole to pole, and the, um, it's become quite a social area now that. You know, you go down there at 8 o'clock on a Saturday morning and there'll be 50, 50 people getting changed there and then it just stays like that all throughout the day. People are coming and going and Saturday and Sunday is the same and it's really getting to be quite a com- community down there now. And once the lockdown lockdown is over, we're expecting to see even more people come come down at key times and such. So it's um, becoming a real social spot for in, in Port, Port, Port Melbourne and the ability to... You know, warm up a little after the um, after after the swim to get back to, back to normal would be so critical in the winter. Um, we're not we're not asking for hot hot showers because you don't want a hot shower if you've been in cold water that doesn't doesn't do the body any good with them rushing the blood flow back to the surface again and causes some um, problems like chillblains and that. So we were just asking for the you know, uh, a warm water shower, sort of 37, 40, 40 degrees max kind of thing. There's six six shower heads down there. And we don't want it on all of them. I was just thinking maybe maybe four four of the shower, shower heads, um, and they can be turned turned off over the summer months, December December through April, when they're not 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 really needed. So they um, they can just simply be be turned off. So that's kind of what I wanted 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 to say. Just bring up the issue and talk about what what um, what the benefits are and how how it could possibly work. Well, I know one of the councillors does it regularly, so um, I don't know if it's at Port Melbourne, but um, thank you very much for your (laughs) submission. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to call on Luke Simpkin, also speaking to item 7.2. Hi, Luke. Hi, how are you? Good, Luke. Uh, Thank you for inviting me. Luke Simpkin from Port Melbourne. Uh, Yeah, look, I won't uh, add a lot more to the previous uh, two presentations, except to say I'm uh, retired and uh, having moved to uh, Port Melbourne five and a half years ago, the first thing I did was um, join the uh, Port Melbourne Icebergers, which was part of the social health and inclusion program that the council sponsored, I believe, at the time. And that developed into a, a weekend uh, community activity, which has um, blossomed into all sorts of um, uh, large um, groups of people who are meeting uh, before work, um, during the day, um, in the evenings, um, in fact, just about any time you can go down and see people who are engaging in cold water swimming and particularly during the winter and particularly during COVID. Um, one of the, the great benefits of the, the cold water swimming, apart from uh, the health benefits, is that it encourages outdoor safe activity. And I, I fear that in the next um, in the next decade, we're going to be uh, looking to uh, safe possible outdoor activities and outdoor swimming is definitely uh, one of those. Um, the uh, warm water showers will add a lot to the capacity of that to be used right through the winter. Just a bit of warmth, just enough to uh, to uh, resuscitate, if you like, after the shock of the cold. It's a remarkably invigorating feeling. It's great to have it happen. And the people gathering and the, the communal benefit, the mental health benefit, the physical health benefit, uh, I think... Um, uh, it well justifies uh, this sort of minor extra provision. Uh, it wouldn't be required at night, and as Ross was suggesting, probably not during the summer necessarily either. Um, and uh, but I think uh, warm water showers would just uh, help to uh, to cement these fantastic community groups and that sort of health giving, mental health giving, and physical health giving benefits um, that it gives the whole community. Thank you very much, Luke. Okay. Uh, I call upon Gary Buck, who is speaking to item 10.3, which is the council's submission in response to Cross Yarra Partnerships amended development plan for the Domain Precinct. Hi, Gary. Hi, thank you. My name is Gary Buck. I live in St Kilda Road. Um, I'm the chairman of the Owners Corp for the Botanica in St Kilda Road. Um, our building is within two metres of the new Anzac station station box, so we are very heavily impacted by the changes. I think it's fair to say that we're not delighted with some of the final designs, but we understand the need for compromise. Um, The reason I wanted to speak tonight is for it to be formally noted that we've been particularly happy with the highly professional way that the council officers, especially 
John Bartels, Dave McNish and Jack Fisher have developed the City of Port Phillip submission. They've clearly understood and engaged with the local community and we feel the resulting submission is very sound and a good compromise for all the conflicting issues and we strongly support their submission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gary. I call upon Karen Baines, who's also speaking to item 10.3, which is the council submission response to cross Yarra Partnerships Amendment <coughs> Development Plan. Hi, Karen. Hello, Louise. Um, my name is Karen Baines and I reside in South Melbourne. I submit that I and my fellow neighbours at Domain Hill and Albert Road will be severely and negatively impacted if the amendments being sought by CYP are approved without modification by the Minister. I congratulate Council officers for their draft submission and the inclusion as highest priorities, the retention of on-street parking spaces and provision of safe and convenient access out of his existing buildings. This is considered critical for our future amenity and livability. It is acknowledged that CYP has had enormous task in having to balance all major stakeholder requirements for this project. However, in some instances, consultation with residents affected by the works appears to have been deprioritized and critical requirements overlooked. I therefore ask that the City of Port Phillip, as a major stakeholder to the project, requests that CYP and Rail Projects Victoria engages with residents to resolve the individual building issues which have been identified in the draft submission before you. I commend Mr. John Bartels and the team of council officers for their engagement with the local community and preparation of the draft submission and urge councillors to endorse it. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, now call on Fraser Reed Smith uh, speaking to item 10.5, which is the Park Street Streetscape Improvement Project. It's the release of the draft concept design for consultation. Hi, Fraser. Uh, my name is Fraser Reed Smith, and I live in One Elwood Road. Mayor, councillors, council officers are to be commended on the extent and thoroughness of their submission to council on the Park Street Streetscape Improvement Project. The submission recognises that bikes provide a low-cost, environmentally friendly and convenient mode of travel. As their submission notes, Park Street is a strategically important east-west bike riding connection. It will link to the main precinct and Amtank station to South Melbourne, Port Melbourne, South Bank and through to Fisherman's Bend. It will also be a link from South Yarra and beyond via the main road, which leads directly into Park Street. Park Street and its footpath are already widely used by cyclists, and this will increase when the Domain Road St Kilda Road intersection opens up again when the Anzac Station uh, project is complete. The idea that future development on the southern side of Park Street will make the revised footpath unworkable is shown by these plans to be unwarranted speculation. In any case, the redesigned King's Place Plaza will become the precinct's community centre, not Park Street. It's also worth noting that Cycle Network supports these Park Street proposals and is not aware of any cycling route that opposes them. From a distance point of view, in terms of safety and aesthetics, cyclists will much prefer to use Park Street rather than alternative routes, as do the several hundred cyclists that live in Elwood Road. It's all a question of distance and Melbourne Road and, and, and Route K don't cut the mustard in this regard. As CDM research outlines, a well-designed Park Street bike link makes a really good sense regarding strategic alignment, cycling activity, crash history, commuter demand, catch, catchment capacity now and in the future, and ease of delivery. The proposal should be put out for public consultation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call upon Julie Clutterbuck, also speaking to item 10.5, Park Street. It's hard to say, Park Street Streetscape Improvement Project. Hi, Julie. Uh, hi, Madam Mayor and 
councillors. Um, Julie Clutterbuck from Elwood, but today I'm speaking on behalf of the Port Phillip Bicycle Users Group. Uh, in March, the council officers presented a really good plan for a protected bike link joining St Kilda Road with Moray Street along Park Street. Tonight, they're presenting an amended plan and this takes the bike lane up onto the footpath between St Kilda Road and Kings Way. There's no physical separation of pedestrians and cyclists, only green paint. The Safe Systems Report presented with the plan clearly explains how this is all to the detriment of both pedestrian and cyclist safety. It states, where the bicycle path transitions to the footpath, there is an increased risk of pedestrian cyclist collision. And the overall safety score is decreased. The Council has done good work on improving safety around cyclist pedestrian conflicts the council area and so it's surprising to me that you're proposing to build in new conflict points. You had a good design in March and I suggest you should stick to that one. Thank you. Thank you. I call upon Karen Baines again um, speaking to item 10.5 which is the Park Street Streetscape Improvement Project. Hi Karen again. Thank you. My name is Karen Baines and I reside in South Melbourne. I submit that the amended concept design prepared by council officers achieves a good balance between all users and incorporates many community benefits. This design builds on the CDM report identifying Park Street as the best alignment for an east-west bike path, quite separate to the Albert Road Shrine to Sea route and the proposed pop-up route K path. Park Street's role in connecting cyclists from South Melbourne and Fisherman's Bend to the St Kilda Road bike path, Anzac Station and King's Domain should not be underestimated. The protected bike path shall also cater for the substantial increase in high-rise developments in sub-precincts 2 and 4, embracing the shift towards sustainable transport options and supporting leisure activities for residents. A major decrease in vehicles and significant increase in bicycles being accommodated is occurring. These riders will all use Park Street. The OC of my apartment building in Albert Road supports the incorporation of a protected bike path in Park Street. Our residents are heavy users of this section of road, both as pedestrians and cyclists, and consider safety for all users is of primary, primary importance. I urge councillors to endorse the release of the draft concept design for community consultation and to expedite the process to bring the 2023 construct, construction date forward. Finally, I commend the council officers for the magnitude of work undertaken in producing the concept of design and their engagement with the local community on this project to date. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I call upon Bob Talbot, also speaking to item 10.5, which is the Park Street Streetscape Improvement Project. Hi, Bob. Hello. Thank you for allowing me to speak, uh, Mayor and Councillors. There has been significant change in the specific area between St Kilda Road and Kingsway since this concept of, of twin bike paths in Park Street uh, was first mooted some years ago. And you've heard tonight about uh, the changes continue even in the last uh, six or 12 months. Tram super stop was substantively, uh, was installed in the area and that substantively and irrevocably changed parking and traffic flows in the area. Uh, it will result in uh, a major interchange destination for travellers when Anzac Station opens. And further, the plan to extend the tram network down Park Street will bring even more pedestrians to and from more destination. CO, uh, C107 has designated the immediate area as having the second biggest potential for residential density in the city of Port Phillip. Specifically, uh, significant commercial development in the area, including a medium-sized supermarket, retail shops and cafes, and 14 venues are currently planned. 
The Park Street Village will likely become a pedestrian hub with the opening of Anzac Station. All of these developments are now coming together with the potential to force a collection of compromises with unintended compromises, and the compromises extend to cyclists. Specifically, a reduction of the footpath width from six metres to three metres and, and to only 1.8 metres where outdoor dining occurs. Second point, designated dining areas will be constrained to 1.2 metres, which is not practical or desirable. Bike paths on both sides of the road will dominate the available footpath. There are numerous other issues and implications uh, associated with the bike path routes. Uh, others will talk about that. Um, describing, it seems to me that describing a bike track that takes 50% of the available footpath as a streetscape improvement project does not indicate a propensity for full disclosure, rather the reverse. It's my belief that if, if Council approves the consultation as it is proposed, it will be complicit uh, in a process that is fundamentally and demonstrably flawed. I thank you for listening. Thank you, Bob. I call upon John Tabart, uh, also speaking to item 10.5. Hi, John. Hi, thank you very much, Mayor, for the opportunity to speak. Um, Mayor and councillors, uh, we request the council pause the proposal to commence public consultation for a, a landscape bike path in Park Street. We're not against bikes, many of us are cyclists, but to, de to demolish the opportunity for a marvellous footpath and community get together area uh, where there are going to be um, in the next five to 10 years, 11 development permits have been issued in this area, three residential and office buildings are already in construction. There'll be an estimated 5,000 new apartments um, with about 9,000 new residents and an estimated 2,000 office workers. The footpath is a very fundamental part of the pedestrian use of this street. We live in it in the middle of it, sub precinct two, we use it every day. It's a great footpath. To reduce it, as you heard, the dimensions to three metres and 1.8 metres wide uh, for the bike path is a fundamental error. There are going to be, um, the numbers here, excuse me, yeah. There's going to be um, uh, seven new shops on the southern footpath and nine on the northern footpath. This is going to be a real community hub to get together for pedestrians. Let's look after the cyclists properly, but they can't impact on the pedestrian space and use it to the extent they, they're going to. Please pause, redesign, preserve and enhance the pedestrian street, allowing the new retail community hub to emerge and to prosper. We live here. We also use cycles. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I call upon David McGowan speaking to the same item, 10.5 Park Street Streetscape Improvement Project. Hi, David. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my name is David McGowan. I live in South Melbourne. This project, is, this project is, a, is poorly named. It is essentially one designed to introduce a dedicated bike link. It is premature to be putting the design out for consultation as the adverse consequences have not been properly considered. The documentation does not mention the extent of built form that is occurring in the area surrounding Park Street East. The number of people living and or working in the immediate area will dramatically increase, as will the number of services and visitors to the area. This section of Park Street is akin to a blank canvas and has great potential for being a community hub in the midst of the density increase. The pedestrian traffic will be high and new businesses will appear along the streetscape with many looking to use part of the footpath. The bike path will cripple the future options. Re-traffic, super tram stop has severely complicated the operation of the road and created bottlenecks for traffic in general. 
Park Street is the last street prior to the city providing a right turn onto Kingsway to travel north. Traffic in peak hours currently seeking to turn right at Kingsway stretches back up Park Street into St Kilda Road and along Wells Street to Coventry Street. The proposed bike link will extend the single traffic line bottleneck. The crash statistics involving bikes show only four incidents in 10 years occurred in this section of Park Street. The case for a bike path in this section of Park Street is flawed as it ignores the adverse consequences. I ask that you press pause on the push for community consultation on the project to enable officers to take into account the implications of the future built form and the significant increase in pedestrian use of Park Street East, reassess the current and likely future demand for a dedicated bike route in Park Street and properly identify the impact of the lost opportunity to achieve a lively pedestrian community hub in Park Street east of Kings Way. A reassessment of the implications is required before any resultant project is put to the wider community. Thank you. Thank you. I call upon George Swinburne, also speaking to item 10.5, which is the Park Street Improvement Project. Hi, George. Hi, Mayor. Thank you very much. My name is George Swinburne. I have lived at the Hallmark for 14 years, which abuts Park Street in South Melbourne. I've submitted a short statement with my request to speak tonight on the Park Street Streetscape Improvement Project, which has not only been submitted with my request to speak tonight, but was sent to all councillors yesterday. So you are aware of my concerns with what has been outlined in the council reports. My main request is that the council defer proceeding with a consultation or construction of the bike paths until the completion of the works in the Anzac station precinct are completed, including relinking traffic to the, from Domain Road along Park Street to and from, diversion of extra trams from St Kilda Road along Park Street and the additional pedestrian traffic created, the installation of new traffic lights in Park Street at the intersection of Well Street and Palmerston Crescent has been in operation and its effectiveness has been assessed and the new retail established as part of conditions in planning permits for new developments in Park Street either approved, awaiting approval or potential and the pedestrian traffic that will be created has been allowed to operate. I cannot understand the council officers and councillors cannot see the problems that will be created by the introduction of bike paths on both sides of Park Street. I am told there are sufficient councillors to waive the motion for consultation through tonight, which is very disappointing. What I do ask is that when sending out the material, council include a statement from residents and ratepayers pointing out the difficulties difficulties they see arising and this could be prepared in consultation with council officers. Thank you for the opportunity to address you tonight. Thank you. Okay, so now I call upon Joe Plummer speaking to item 12.3 which is the South Melbourne Market Annual Report 2020 and 2021. Hi Joe. Thank you Mayor. Um, it is with great pleasure on behalf of the Special Advisory Committee that I do present the South Melbourne Market Annual Report to you all. I know you've had a very busy night so I'll keep it brief. Um, certainly the annual report records the highlights and challenges of what can only be described as an extraordinary year um, in many people's lives and certainly um, there are many uh, people in our market that we have much to thank them for in terms of continuing to serve our community with fresh foods and the like but also to <clears throat> acknowledge the ones who lost their livelihoods at a, at a moment's notice and that was incredibly sad. Having said that, um, we are certainly, um, I guess, really proud of many of the successes that have continued through. So we've welcomed some new fantastic businesses like the likes of Little Hof uh, and, and Marco, who are, are both in the food industry and very unique in their proposition. Um, we, of course, um, had, I guess, a new normal for a period of time where we managed to activate 35 different public events and the like um, for our community during the partial closure of Cecil Street. 
Um, and we also continue to deliver on our sustainability initiatives. And in fact, 67% of our waste from landfill um, went, went into 14 different recycling streams. We also had 3.9 million visitors, which although it's 23% lower um, than the previous year, um, indeed, that's still an important and popular destination um, within your council. So um, it's also fair to say that whilst we had a significant decline in parking revenue and we had to freeze uh, rental um, rental fees and the like and also noting that the council very generously supported traders with rent relief we did certainly manage to make a very small operating surplus um, going forward we are very confident um, in the success we know that our traders um, and customers are very very loyal and have an abundance of strength and resilience um, and we're incredibly optimistic with the strategic plan that we have before us and so our annual plan we proudly commend to you um, and certainly happy to take any questions that you might have thank you thank you joe now we have received further submissions to be read out on behalf of members of the public and i will call out the name of each member of the public and then refer to the head of governance to read a summary of the submissions uh, 10.5, uh, in relation to 10.5, which is the Park Street streetscape, we have Craig Richards from the CEO of the Bicycle Network. Through you, Mayor, and the submission reads, I respectfully ask that Council adopts the officer's recommendation to proceed to public consultation. There has already been an extended period of internal investigation, review and revision at officer and council level relating to this project. It is appropriate and desirable that the wider community be now exposed to the issues at stake and are given the opportunity to contribute to the development and refinement of the proposal. Bicycle Network believes that it is opportune for public input at this time, given that other related projects continue to move forward in this precinct. It would, be, it would appear negligent if council delayed further and was not able to take advantage of those opportunities. The Park Street initiative has developed through various council processes over a number of years and is mature and ready for an encounter with the public. The City of Port Phillip is rightfully proud of its approach to governance. I ask that you allow the public a voice on this important matter. Thank you. So that's the last of our speakers uh, and submissions. So now we move on to councillor question time. So councillors, do you have any questions for the officers? Thank you. Any questions? Uh, Councillor Pearl. Thanks very much, Madam Mayor. Um, question to officers relating to the previous motion of council for to investigate the purchase of mobile CCTV uh, for a report to come back in October. I'm wondering if officers can provide an update on where that report is and when it will be presented to council. Who am I going to? Brian T or is it Peter Smith? Through you, may I just take that one notice unless Tony Keeney can help me or Anthony Trails but... No, all right, we'll take that on notice. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, through, through you, Madam Mayor, Anthony oh. Trail here. Yep. Um, thanks for the question, Marcus. The, we're still waiting on that federal grant. We've been through told you, there's a delay. Um, yep, Anthony here, yep. Uh, there's a delay on that grant, so we're, we're just waiting a new date on that. Um, we expect that to come in November, December still. Great, thank you. Uh, Councillor Clark. Yes, yeah, so I wanted to ask council officers about the warm showers um, the comments that we've heard tonight. And do we have warm showers anywhere else in the municipality? Uh, do we have a response for that or should we wait till we get to the petition? You can do that uh, if you want, sorry. Or who's three, that? Through you, Mayor Chris Carroll here. I, thank you. I don't believe we do, but I'll have to take it on notice. We have done some initial work on this. I don't believe there are council provide warm showers like this elsewhere, um, but I'd have to take it on notice and come back to you to, to, to confirm that. And, and perhaps you might take this on notice too, sorry, as a follow-up. Would we be proposing 
to consider putting warm showers just in the Port Melbourne or would this be something we would consider across the municipality? I think one of the things that we would need to, one of the things we have talked about as officers in providing advice to councillors will be um, whether the consideration of whether we would need to put this in other places as well from an equity perspective, mm. while noting um, the drive has come from one particular club at the moment uh, in one particular location, but certainly the precedent that it sets um, and uh, be something that the council will need to consider in making its decision to be part of the report back. Thank you. Any further councillor questions? All right, moving along then, we've got a ceiling schedule, but we do not have any ceiling to do tonight. So let's move on to seven, which is petitions and joint letters. We have two petitions tonight on our agenda. So item 7.1 is the petition, safety issues, Linton Street, Balaclava. Councillors, do we have any questions of the officers in regard to this petition or this Uh, no questions at this point in time. All right, then do I, we have an officer's recommendation. Do I have a mover and a seconder? Come on, don't be shy, everyone. I'm happy to move this, so I will move it and I'll have a seconder, Councillor Pearl. Thank you very much. So I, um, I will speak to it. I look, I look forward to hearing the responses. I did a little visit to Linton Street myself to refresh myself on the street this week um, and, and took note of, so when, Thank you to the speakers that spoke tonight. I, I had a clearer idea of what of what you were talking about, but I look forward to the officer's uh, response in the next few weeks. Councillor Pearl. Echo those comments. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? No, let's put that to the vote. Uh, Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Consolo? Aye. Councillor Martin? Four. Councillor Pearl? In favour. Councillor Sirikoff? Four. Councillor Baxter? Four. That motion is carried. So moving on to item 7.2, which is the petition requesting warm water outside showers at Port Melbourne Life Saving Club. Councillors, do we have any questions for the officers in regard to uh, this item? Councillor Consolo? Thank you. Um, I guess this would come back in the further report, but you mentioned earlier with equity and could it be considered if, say, the Icebergs Club organised to purchase the, um, the electric instantaneous water heaters themselves and it would just be an installation, things like that, so that it wouldn't be that it, they really, it was, could be provided by the club if it had to be, but it's the permission to put it there. And uh, I think, it, I guess in, as a question, would does council have a an electricity, sorry, the motorbike here, uh, an electricity deal that is better than, say, residential prices that makes this a, um, a fairly affordable proposition? So it's either Mark Thompson or Joe McNeil. Through you, Mayor, Joanne here, um, I will, uh, start off the the response um, so officers have and have started a review of this um, proposal which was raised a couple of months ago by community members and so work is underway and a briefing is scheduled for councillors in early December and as part of that officers will bring back some options which will look at um, the, the the question that was just raised around well is there an option for um, you know, others to purchase, people to chip in and purchase um, the, the warm shower infrastructure and it to just be located on council infrastructure. How would that work? What are the pros and cons with that? What are the problems or benefits? Uh, and uh, what are the other ways of doing that? Um, and what are the possible costs? And also this consideration of, um, you know, how this might be then made available in other places along the foreshore. And just on, sorry, on the question of do we have a, um, a better um, electricity deal, um, I, I would have to take that part on notice unless Chris or Mark is able to answer that part. I will take that on notice as part of that report. 
Uh, thank you. Any other questions for officers? If we don't have any further questions, councillors, we have an officer's recommendation. Do we have a mover and a second or this or something different? Okay, councillor. Oh, they're all there. Okay, councillor Pearl to move and councillor Martin to second. Councillor Pearl. I reserve, Madam Mayor. Okay, councillor Martin. Very briefly, Madam Mayor, I've been swimming at Port Phillip beaches for over 60 years and in unless it's a very hot day, I go home covered in goosebumps. I fully um, support the request of the petitioners to us to, for us to investigate this. However, um, we'll have to come back and see whether it financially it's feasible, but well worthwhile investigating. I'm sure there'll be many thousands of Port Phillip residents who'd love to know that at least we're investigating this for them. All right. Would any other councillor like to speak to the motion? Uh, councillor Consolo. Thank you. Thank you to the speakers tonight. And I'm impressed there's uh, 149 signatures. I welcome this petition and I'm interested to hear the results of the officer's investigation as maybe more people across the municipality might as well. I do swim in the bay, so I understand the request firsthand. Uh, for those going out to work, a short shower makes all the difference. There are some municipalities out there that do have warm showers. Maybe not, we don't, but there are other ones. A timer could be used if people are worried about excessive water use. They, uh, they're being proposed outside, so it isn't it someone's going to be taking a 20 minute private shower in the change room. It's a quick rinse that is not colder than the water in the bay. And um, I would personally leave one or two warm showers in the summer because my little children shiver after nippers and refuse to go in the cold showers to rinse. So it can be really difficult to get them dressed with that um, salt, you know, the, the water makes it hard to, yeah. Sadly, there are not separate foot wash showers at Port Melbourne either, and many nippers would welcome these warm showers. Port Melbourne is one of the most popular locations for bay swimming due to the icebergs and the Cafe de Lido there that everyone grabs a coffee after. Uh, there's no plan to include this South Melbourne Life Saving Club in the upgrade in the forward schedule, and that toilet block uh, doesn't have proposed works anytime soon either. The residents of South of Port Melbourne and Albert Park deserve this small upgrade to the outdoor showers at the public toilet block. So please support this tonight so we can hear what the officers have to say, what the officers have already been working on when they investigate this. Thank you. Thank you. I'll briefly just add to uh, the conversation. I will be supporting uh, this motion because I know there's a lot of base swimmers at Elwood that perhaps would be interested in the investigation. I don't know if there's an actual formal club. I, I Maybe it's the penguins. Anyway, I'm sure that they would be the many groups that I see in the morning. I've never joined them, uh, but perhaps I would if there were warm showers. So I think this investigation has, has merit across the municipality. Anyone else like to speak to the motion? Councillor Pearl. I think everything's been said, Madam Mayor. Happy to support. You're a, you're a base swimmer yourself, aren't you, Councillor Pearl? I was this morning. Oh, goodness. Okay, let's move that to the vote. Uh, Councillor Clark? Four. Councillor Copsey? Four. Councillor Crawford? Four. Councillor Consolo? Four. Uh, Councillor Martin? Four. Councillor Pearl? In favour. Councillor Sirikoff? Four. Councillor Baxter? Four. Councillor Bond? Four. The motion is carried unanimously. We're moving to 8 to 14, which is the presentation of reports. So we're now going to move through, councillors, uh, the reports that you have indicated that you wish to speak to. So starting with 8.1, which is the presentation of the CEO report, issue 79. Councillors, we have an, off, uh, an officer's report. Are there any questions for the officers? No questions. All right. Do I have a mover? I think Councillor Martin is off to the, off to a good start moving, and Councillor Pell to second. Councillor Martin. I'll speak briefly, Madam Mayor. I've mentioned on a number of occasions that one of the most, one of my favourite documents is the CEO's report because it is such an informative document and gives everyone a very good idea of what's happened in the city of Port Phillip over the past three months. And I also. Uh, love the new format. It's far easy to read it. I'm sure those people out there, members of the public and ratepayers will find this report. The information is still there, but it's much easier to access. And I note there are some very fascinating pieces of information there. The success of our Port Phillip Zero program in finding accommodation for our homeless. The excellent record that our childcare centres have had in um, meeting the standards set by the state government. 
I notice that there's movement coming up on the uh, road safety audit at the new Port Melbourne Secondary College, and we look forward to seeing the outcome of that. And in a, in a bit of a concern, I can see that there's been a very significant increase in the council's cash deficit, and I'm sure that we'll be learning more about that in a couple of weeks. But I certainly commend this report, as I do every every month that it comes up. It just has so much information, and uh, I certainly commend it to councillors and the rest of the people of Port Phillip. Councillor Pearl. No need to speak, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? I will briefly add. Uh, there's two things I wanted to highlight. Uh, Councillor Martin mentioned one of them. I'm really proud of the um, the steps or progress we've made with Port Phillip Zero. Uh, I know that there have been many, many downsides to this pandemic, but one of the upsides has been finding homes for those who are rough sleeping um, and packages to get them into long secure and supported um, housing and that our Port Phillip Zero list, our by name list has already been reduced and we have 48 people that have moved into long term housing. That is a fantastic outcome and I look forward to um, continuing to work with the state government um, on some of those packages, homes, uh, housing to homes or ho homes to housing um, and looking forward to that list reducing and finding more homes for the vulnerable in our city. The other one that I'm really excited to, uh, I want to kind of do a double whammy, uh, is the mention of St Kilda Festival returning. We decided a few weeks ago to go ahead with that. And I'm very excited to say that vaccination rates in Melbourne are, are flying. Uh, and I want to encourage our community to continue getting vaccinated. I know that our rates are getting up there. and But also exciting that with these kind of vaccination rates, um, the timing of the St Kilda Festival could be perfect for celebrating what this new COVID life looks like, but um, bringing back that vibrancy and passion to St Kilda. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? Councillor Martin to close. Uh, no need, Madam Mayor. All right, let's put that to the vote, everyone. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Sirikoff. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. That motion is carried. We're now moving on to item 10.3, which is the council submission in response to the Cross Yarra Partnerships amended development plan for the Domain Precinct, which is Anzac Station and surrounds. Councillors, are there any questions from the officers in regards to this report? No questions for the officers? If not, we have an officer's recommendation. Do I have a mover for this or something different? Councillor Martin, you're fast off out of the gate today. Councillor Martin to move, who is going to second? Councillor Copsey. Thank you, Councillor Martin. This is an excellent piece of work by our council officers. It picks up a lot of the information that's come through the various consult consultations that councillors had. It's picked up on the uh, briefings that the officers have had with councillors, and I think it, it picks up on just about every point that's been raised over the last few months. In particular, I note that parking in St Kilda Road has been a huge issue of contention, and many, many of us on council have received a, a lot of lobbying by residents of St Kilda Road, urging council to do everything it can to maintain as much parking as possible, and that's one of the major points in this um, document that our council officers produce. I think it's a fantastic piece of work, and I hope we endorse it unanimously. Councillor Copsey. Thank you. I um, echo Councillor Martin's comments there and I just wanted to thank everybody who has been involved in this process so far. It is a transformative project for um, this area of our city and I was so pleased to hear the comments from um, residents today regarding the work of our officers. I also echo that. I think it's been incredibly detailed um, and has been has really strived to, as has been said, find the balance and find what's going to work um, for this really transformational project for um, improved accessibility and public realm, I think, in the long run. Uh, and I think that the officers have done a really excellent job of putting forward the city's views here. So thank you very much. And I hope we'll endorse this also. Are there any other councillors who'd like to speak to the motion? Councillor Consolo. Thank you. Uh, we have received many emails as ward councillors on this proposal and 
many, we have read through them and have heard them. Many have been included in this proposal, maybe at a higher level than in the more um, specific way they were written. So I'm confident that we have come as a council group to want to support more parking in that area and have seen that we've had some effect and want to keep that on the table. So I appreciate that this is the amount of work that's gone into this and thank the officers and we'll be supporting it tonight. Are there any other councillors who'd like to speak to the motion? No? I'm going to return to Peter Martin. Uh, no need to speak, Madam Mayor. Said it all previously. Okay, let's put that to the vote, everyone. Councillor Martin. In favour. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Sirikov. For. Councillor Baxter. For. Councillor Bond. For. Oh, great. Councillor Clark. For. Councillor Copsey. For. Councillor Crawford. For. And Councillor Consolo. For. The motion is carried unanimously. Item 10.4 is the soap dispenser trial in public toilets. So, councillors, we have a, a report from officers. Are there any questions that you would like to ask? Do we have any questions? Or is that a mover? Do we have any questions? Oh, oh. I have a question, if I may, before we go to moving it. I was wondering, and the question will be, I guess, for Lachlan Johnson. I know we're going to trial it. Well, the, the recommendation is to trial it across um, the the foreshore toilets. But I wondered, are there toilet blocks that are hard, underutilised in our municipality that perhaps it isn't something like if we were going to stage it out that we don't necessarily need to provide it in? I mean, do we have that kind of data around the utilisation of our toilet blocks or can we judge that by, by the amount of toilet paper that people go through? But just a kind of a sense of Through which you, ones. Mayor, I'll Chris Carroll here. Lachlan will certainly add to that, but I'm, what I can say is that we, you, you, you referenced Mark Thompson, our um, head of asset management, earlier tonight, and we've also had um, Manaha Isarapu, who is our CIO, been working together on introducing some smart technology that will start to count in in some of our some sensors that will count um, visits to toilet to give us better information on utilisation and also to proactively um, start to schedule um, work orders for maintenance if there's high volumes of traffic rather than just our set service levels. That's a little way, a little way off, but we are working towards it um, in the next 12 months or the next nine months. I'm hopeful to see that rolled out. I'll hand over to Lachlan. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mayor, just to add to what uh, Chris said as well, the reason why we've selected the public toilets along the foreshore is that these are some of the most um, heavily used um, facilities that council provides across the municipality. So they will provide us a, uh, an indicative um, uh, measure of success um, and scalability uh, at the end of the trial uh, as well. So, um, but as uh, Chris indicated, uh, the upcoming rollout of those sensors are really gonna provide us some very valuable data to inform not just future things such as uh, the rollout of soap dispensers, but also our, our significant maintenance and cleaning program as well. Yes, um, I've got the giggles, but it is more effective than the amount of toilet paper used. I think those sensors, I look forward to them coming on board. Uh, I think Councillor Consolo also has a question. Yes, with our new, when we do a new toilet block, is it standard to put in a soap dispenser already, or would this be across the board, everyone needs an upgrade? Lachlan Johnson. For you, Mayor, um, it's not currently standard practice to install soap dispensers uh, in our public toilet blocks, but um, uh, obviously if council did resolve following the trial to roll out soap dispensers at public facilities, that would be something we'd have to look at in terms of our specification for projects. Right, any further questions? If not, I already had a mover, Councillor Consolo to move and Councillor Baxter to second. Councillor Consolo. Thank you for preparing this report for us for tonight uh, on the back of minors in motion and requesting it. I find the lack of uh, soap in our um, 
public toilets very disturbing. I was in the city of Bayside the other day with my children in a public toilet block. There was absolutely no toilet paper. And a random person said to me, well, thank goodness there's soap. And it's interesting that in our municipality, we couldn't say that. And it's really embarrassing as a counselor to me to say, well, we don't have it up in city of Port Phillip. So I hope that people will support this tonight. I wish it was everywhere right now, but I appreciate the small step to get it into our most visited areas along the foreshore as soon as possible and uh, um, see the results. Thank you. Councillor Baxter. Uh, thanks, Madam Mayor. Look, um, the, the provision of, uh, of public services to meet basic needs is the sign of a, of a good government and therefore <laughs> local government has to has to provide um, uh, public toilets, which which we do. But they also need to provide really good quality um, public toilets, and I think that's something that we um, can work on and improve on. Um, given given the heavy use of, of of our public toilets by heaps of people, not just our residents, but people from all over Victoria, right? And we get that it's a bit of a challenge, right? It's not just any old um, uh, community public toilets. They're 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 Victoria's public toilets, but um, what we uh, what we need to to factor into that is um, the increasing need for um, for better hygiene that comes with the pandemic. And so, um, I, I uh, really think that um, Councillor Consolo's motion has has led to us, you know, a, a good step here. Um, really, yeah, really want to see some good good data out of this trial and see uh, what can be done out of it, but. In general, I think we need to step up our game in this in this sort of area, and um, yeah, I'm keen to see what we can do. I believe Councillor Martin would also like to speak to the motion. Well, I'd like to thank my colleague Councillor Consolo for bringing this matter up first as a note of motion, and secondly, working with our council officers to present this recommendation tonight. I mentioned when the notice of motion came up that, as a school principal, the major issue in schools and for over 30 years it was always soap or the lack thereof and now we're in the hands of our council officers to find something that's cheap effective and vandal proof and if we can find that and we can manage that in the trial then hopefully we look forward to having all of our public toilets across the municipality with appropriate soap dispensers if this trial is successful so thank you councillor consolo would anyone else like to speak to the motion councillor consolo would you like to close All right, let's put that. Let's put that to the vote. Uh, Councillor Pearl, in favour. Councillor Sirikov, for. Councillor Baxter, for. Councillor Bond, for. Councillor Clark, for. Uh, Councillor Copsey, for. Councillor Crawford, for. Councillor Consolo, for. And Councillor Martin, for. The motion is carried unanimously. Moving on to 10.5, which is the Park Street Streetscape Improvement Project, the release of the draft concept design for consultation. Councillors, do we have any questions for the officers in regards to this report? Councillor Sirikoff. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, over the past few days, uh, councillors have received emails from some owner occupy some owner occupier property owners in um, apartment buildings that will be affected by the draft plan of Park Street near the Anzac station. Uh, one of the concerns uh, that has been raised um, is the process and reach to the, on the community consultation uh, to not only tenants and residents, but also with non-resident owner ratepayers in this precinct. Uh, can Council please provide details as to how and who will be notified of the draft plan so as to include not only residents but also non-resident pro property owners in the neighbourhood? Uh, John Bartels. Through you, Mayor. Um, it's fair to say that the information contained within Section 5 of the Council report and Attachment 5 um, provides a high level overview of the communications and engagement approach proposed on this project. Uh, in terms of the proposed notification of properties along Park Street and nearby, uh, the intention is to send a multi-page leaflet via uh, direct addressed mail using Australia Post 
to both, uh, to not just both, sorry, uh, to tenants, residents, and property owners. Um, the initial analysis we've completed is the distribution of this leaflet equates to approximately 4,800 addressees covering all properties um, in the areas bounded by St Kilda Road, Dorcas Street, Clarendon Street, Palmerston Crescent, Kingsway and Albert Road back to St Kilda Road. Uh, it is intended that leaflet will include the information on the project and draft design supported by plans and other visuals um, to make it clear what is being proposed, along with clear information in regards to the consultation process and options for providing feedback as part of this process. Thank you. Are there any further questions? If not, do we have, we have an officer's recommendation, do I have a mover of this or something different? Councillor Martin to move. Would anyone like to second? I'm happy to second. Oh, Councillor Copsey. Councillor Copsey got there. Great. Councillor Martin. Thank you, Mayor. Firstly, I know, I know our council officers have done a, a lot of work. We had a motion at our council meeting some months ago after an initial meeting with some of the local residents to come up with an amended plan for the Park Street bike path. And at the time, as, as a regular cyclist, I don't believe that the amended plan the amended path is quite as effective for, for we cyclists as the original design was. However, many of the concerns of the local residents about additional parking, loading bays and so on have been incorporated into the new design. I believe it's an excellent compromise. We've heard from speakers earlier today and a number of whom who perhaps said similar things to me that, yes, as cyclists, we may have preferred something that uh, was a, a little more akin to the original design, but we believe that we've taken into account most of the views that have been put forward. And even for those people who currently aren't in favour of the uh, concept as it's going out to consultation, they will have the opportunity during the consultation process to make their views known. And I was quite heartened to hear that our council officers are going to make every effort to include as many people as possible in that consultation. So I believe this is quite an excellent design to go to consultation and when the results of the consultation come in, council can then make a decision based on the information that we've received from the public as well as from our own judgments. Uh, Councillor Copsey. I'm really pleased that we're um, back to the point of considering putting this out to consultation. Uh, this project has been in gestation quite a while and uh, once again I think it's really fantastic um, the hard work that the officers have gone to to incorporate community feedback and take that on board. Um, I share Councillor Martin's view. I'm slightly concerned about the reduction in safety outcomes that's come from the um, revamped design but I am very pleased that we're going to progress to the point where we're going to be able to hear um, the views from the consultation on this. It's a much needed project and uh, I look forward to all those in the community who've um, shared their views tonight participating in this process and hopefully um, many, many more people who live, work, use um, Park Street uh, can also contribute to that process. So very pleased to be moving to consultation. Would any other councillors like to speak to the motion? Councillor Bond. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. A couple of months ago, we set the officers of task of coming back with a proposal that that deals with the, the lack of loading bays in this area and the lack of parking in this area should the original proposal have gone ahead. Um, they've come back with an option that um, addresses those concerns that I had with this original proposal. Um, this allows for parking and or loading bays to be located within that strip. Um, which means that uh, this, this street will be able to function um, once we get all those residents and all those developments uh, built and the, the shops and businesses are, are located in this area at some point in time in the future. Um, we've heard tonight from some residents who, who believe the, the, the bike lane um, moving, encroaching onto some of the footpath is going to be a terrible outcome for the for the pedestrians and we've heard from some of the cycling groups who think that the the bike lane encroaching onto the footpath is going to be a terrible outcome for cyclists um i still maintain um that you know with my experiences of high density congested areas that if we don't make these changes the 
the all the vans, delivery vans and removalist vans will either A, park on the footpath, which means for the pedestrians will need to walk out into the bike lane and into the traffic to get along the street, or B, they'll park in the bike lane, meaning cyclists will either have to ride on the footpath or ride out in the traffic in order to get along the street. And the, these changes are crucial to enable this street to continue to to function as, as a street. It, yes, it's not probably not the best, um, you know, if you wanted to build a bike path, you'd probably build a much better bike path than this. If you wanted to look after pedestrians, you could probably do a much better job of looking after pedestrians. But this is about ensuring that all groups who use this street are catered for. And I think this this outcome um, gives us a, an opportunity to to allow that to happen and the street to continue to function, but also you know uh, assist, provide a space for pedestrians, provide a space for outdoor dining and provide a, a way for cyclists to travel up and down the street um, safely or much more safer than they than they do at uh, present. You now we're not making a decision here tonight. Well, all we're doing is putting this out to consultation. So, you know, all the, the residents who disagree with this, um, by all means, get get your feedback to us and tell us what you think. Tell us here's what you'd like to see changed. Same with the cycling groups. Um, we're, we're about hearing from you um, on this proposal and then we'll come back at some point in time in the future and we will make a decision on this once we've heard from from everyone who's in this area, whether you're cyclists, pedestrians, businesses, um, you know, drivers, anyone else who uses this particular um, section of Path Street. So by all means, get your feedback to us. Um, look forward to reading that and hearing from people and um, seeing what what pushback we get, what challenges we get, um, which and which bits people like about this. And um, will it, we will certainly adjust our our thinking and adjust our plans where required if if better ideas uh, are thrown up by this consultation process then we and we see ways to improve what we are putting out so I'll, I'll be supporting this tonight um and yeah welcome all that feedback from from those with an interest in this particular area thank you uh councillor Sirikoff. uh thank you madam mayor yeah i'd um i think uh councillor bonds um Put it put it uh, forward very well. Um, I'm glad that the uh, consultation period has been delayed to include these loading bays um, because uh, it, it really does add to the amenity of all those hundreds and hundreds of people who live in these apartment uh, buildings and to um, as uh, Councillor Bond said the um, inconvenience of not having such loading bays and the impact on uh, trucks turning up whether it be deliveries or uh, rental trucks for um, people moving in and out or delivering a refrigerator. I remember Councillor Bond re referring to uh, at one meeting um, and not having to carry it, you know, 100 metres down the street. Uh, this is a very important um, amenity to the people in these buildings. Um, so I'm glad that um, the these loading bays have been included. Um, uh, so I also encourage um, all everybody out there to um, those 4,800 um, leaflets that will be going out uh, to have your say, um, put forward your um, all the positive ideas that you have uh, for this uh, draft plan and anything that you might feel that will be an impact that, uh, or improvement to the livability for everybody. So um, I'm in support of the plan going forward um, as a draft and hearing from everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Consolo. Thank you. In my design work experience, I know it's really hard to, to figure out when's best to get feedback. You want it to be right uh, and as good as possible, but it's also important if you leave it too late, you're not, you're going to miss some feedback that you, there could be some feedback that you're missing. And so it's really important that we do take this to the community to get the, the views and that distribution by the leaflet sounds very thorough. So I'm pleased to hear that it's going to be distributed like that. And it's now up to the community to give us the feedback. Uh, I hear the concerns about the effects of the reduced footpaths as they are very nice and luxurious at the moment. Catering to multiple modes of transport in one area is definitely hard, especially when the tram took up so much of this space. These will all need to be considered, but tonight we're talking about getting community feedback and then we'll later decide. So I will be supporting this tonight. Would any other councillor like to speak to the motion? Councillor Pearl. Thanks, Madam Mayor. I still don't 
uh, I haven't really changed my position on this for many, many years, but the, the this has the potential to be a, um, I wouldn't say a spectacular boulevard, but a very functional boulevard um, from a hospitality point of view and a community place-making point of view. Uh, that we don't need to go over the past in terms of the mistakes that have been made around the installation of the tram stop. We advocated as hard as we possibly could on that and we, we, we didn't get the result we wanted. Fortunately, there's some signalisation, et cetera, happening there. But I, I, I still think that Route K is the best um, route and potentially uh, smaller routes on Bowen Crescent and Albert Road also. But in terms of taking up that much foot pace, footpath space, uh, for the provision of the bike path as it's currently proposed. I think there's an argument to say, let, let's wait a little longer to wait for the fill of the buildings to be installed into the area. So um, the place has some uh, concept in terms of its relationship to the road. So the building has some concept to the relationship of the footpath and the road. And that will take time because those buildings will take time to come up, albeit they'll be there probably in the next couple of years. So I understand the argument around build it and they will come. And I'm sure bike riders will use the route once it's installed. It's just whether or not that is the appropriate place for it and whether or not the balance, we've got the balance here right around um, transport options versus the actual streetscape. So, because it's a 30 or 40 year decision. Um, and I've said this for a number of years, there's so much change going on that area and it's, it's a bit, um, for use of a better word, discombobulated in terms of the way the design process and the in the precinct is going at the moment. I don't see any issues why we can't um, hold off, as I've said, for uh, a number of years on this issue. Albeit, to end on a positive note, I think the uh, improvements that have been driven by officers through this, this design compared to the previous design, particularly pertaining to um, parking and loading zones, etc., have been a substantial improvement. But really, let's face it, these uh, issues that I think are probably peripheral compared to the the main issue about what we want the streetscape to look like from a um, livability, functionality point of view, um, hospitality point of view, as well as a transport point of view. And I don't think we've got that jigsaw puzzle right. Uh, having said that, I'm uh, looking forward to seeing what um, feedback we get from the community on this issue. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? I have a few words I'd like to add. I think tonight it was great to hear from a few speakers, um, but we haven't heard from the wider community and that's why I will be supporting this to go out for consultation. I think we have come a long way um, over the years, but particularly since the last, um, the last draft concept in trying to accommodate the varying needs of different stakeholders. Uh, and one of the things that I remember from early uh, days of learning about Fisherman's Bend is there is a certain width of street and um, and pavement that is actually more conducive to creating a hub and a community feel and uh, a stickiness in, in terms of placemaking. And um, narrow footpaths are not, uh, or narrower footpaths are not actually an obstruction uh, to developing great places. I mean, you look at the vibrancy of Chapel Street and all of those places, they do not need wide footpaths to deliver a great outcome for the community. I think now in a time of disruption before, um, you know, there's not a lot of businesses that would want to be there right now because the look and the feel of the street ain't particularly great. But while there is disruption and we can make it all happen now, uh, the design actually sets the street up to be an amazing hub with more greenery, uh, clever design, opportunity for placemaking and murals and all of that. So now is the perfect time to get that in place for as future developments come on, it can grow rather than disruption at a later date. Um, I think we need to balance the, the fit of everyone, uh, all, all the requirements of everyone in the community. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing people's feedback. I think as the train comes online too, there'll be more people and uh, trying to retrofit any kind of bike path, as we know, becomes more and more difficult. So now is the time to beautify the street, create amenity, create a place where businesses would want to come and set up and create hospitality venues and hubs and community uh, and narrow streets are not going to be a disruption or an, uh, uh, an obstacle to delivering that for the community. So I'm very happy to support this to go out to consultation. Anyone else like to speak to the motion or shall I go back to Councillor Martin? Councillor Martin. 
If I was speaking as a cyclist who drinks at the Limerick Arms Hotel, I'd preferred option, the initial option. As the local ward councillor, I think the recommendations before us tonight takes into account all the, all the consultation and discussions that have taken place and is a far better fit for the area than the original uh, design. I note Councillor Pearl's concerns about are we rushing into this? I see this area as being an area of great change for many, many, many years. And if we decided to wait until the area was settled, we, we could be waiting 10, 15 or even 20 years. Uh, we may never get any of these works done at all. So I think at, at, at least at the moment, the time is right to go to consultation. Let's see what the, the people who are part of the consultation tell us. And hopefully we can make a unanimous decision about what we want to see in this area when it comes back to council in a few months' time. Right, let's put that to the vote. Councillor Sirikoff? Four. Councillor Baxter? Four. Councillor Bond? Four. Councillor Clark? Four. Councillor Copsey? Four. Councillor Crawford? Four. Councillor Consolo? Four. Councillor Martin? Four. And Councillor Pearl? Against. That motion is carried. So, councillors, I thought we'd do item just for your uh, information, do item 12.1, and then we will take a 10 minute break. So, we are doing item 12.1, which is the St Kilda Esplanade Market Annual Report and updated reference committee terms of reference. Councillors, do we have any questions for the officers in regards to this report? No questions. Uh, do we have a mover and seconder for this or something different? Councillor Bond to move. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Pearl to second. Councillor Bond. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, look, it's been a very challenging 18 months for St Kilda and the Esplanade market's probably symbolic of that, having to open and close on many occasions, um, having to deal with the restrictions and things that have occurred over the last 18 months. And it's probably you know, no secret that the market has, has suffered a little bit throughout that time because of the impact of all these um, events that have occurred. So hopefully as of, as of Friday, all of that is now behind us. The market can open up at the earliest opportunity, which I think is going to be the last week in the October will be open albeit with you know, still some restrictions, but we know it's going to be no looking back from them. It's only going to build um, from there. Um, I'd like to thank the committee for the last 12 months, um, made up of traders and staff and a couple of councillors who have um, spent a bit of time on this over the last few months. You know, we all um, are realistic about where this market is at this point in time, um, and we're, we're certainly going to to do our best to bring it back to to where it was um, pre pre pandemic, um, and hopefully make that a vibrant, thriving uh, place in St Kilda again. Um, we've already started to make a few changes. We've got Gabby's come back as the market manager after a magnificent five year spell um, a few years back. Gabby's come back, and we are very grateful for Gabby to coming back to help us out here. Um, and we'll we'll certainly give Gabby all the support she she needs from a council point of view. And um, I know we're asking a lot to to bring this market back, but I'm sure Gabby's the person that can do it at this point in time. And I really look forward to to that occurring. So welcome back, Gabby, and, and commend this this report to councillors and ask them all to support it and ask them all to get back to you know, go down and visit the market on the 31st of October, which is going to be the first Sunday of trading. Um, Buy something, support the traders, and let's let's bring this you know, 50 year old piece of um, St Kilda back to life. We missed out on our 50 year anniversary because of all the the, the shutdowns and issues we had last year. Um, so we might have to look at next year celebrating the 51st or 52nd birthday um, once the market's back and, and up and running again. Um, and as I hear out the windows, there's a whole heap of uh, fireworks going off on the St Kilda Esplanade at the moment. So it's someone's decided to celebrate before we actually get down there um, and open up the market, which is yeah, quite quite interesting. But yeah, they've just set off a heap of fireworks. But thank you very much to everyone and all your hard work on this. I know we'll get there in the end. Uh, it's going to be yeah, interesting hard work to be done over the next six to 12 months, but I'm sure we'll get there. And this time next year, we'll have a great market back on the Upper Esplanade. 
Thanks, Councillor Bond. Is that on the beach or somewhere we should be concerned No, I about? think it's in Alfred Square, just quietly from oh, where okay. I could hear right. it from. So. There's plenty of cars down on the beach making a bit of noise, so I think people have decided to come out of lockdown a couple of days early. But Right. Well, they've got till 9 o'clock, so we're good for a minute. Okay. Uh, Councillor, who did I second it? Sorry. Uh, hey, Councillor Pearl, Pearl, thank you. Yep. Sounds like the 18-year-old um, version of Councillor Bond's out now for Alfred Strew, is it? Interesting in itself. Um, I Explosion would say... Together, anyway. Thank you, Councillor Bond. <laughs> Um, I would say that it's um, there's no better place to party in Victoria than party in Port Phillip, and hopefully um, that that starts to flow back as of midnight on Thursday night, and we bring back the vibrancy and the culture that we love about our, our community and and the benefits it provides um, artistically, financially, um, more broadly from a society and cultural point of view. Uh, and this market is a key component to that. And I, I wish the the committee and the market team all the very best in, in, I'll use the word, resurrecting this market into something bigger and better than what we had pre-COVID because it, it's a key component of the um, economy down at that end of town. And it, it's critically important from a cultural and a social point of view. So I'll hardly support the work that's been going on there and ha very happy to support the uh, the report that's been issued to council tonight and thank everybody for their service. Great, Councillor Sirikoff. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, the, um, we all know that the uh, Esplanade uh, market has a reputation of being an artisan market for um, all of our um, dedicated uh, artists and um, who, who specialise in their arts and crafts and ha has over many years attracted um, international and interstate visitors along with uh, the locals and Melbournians um, to Saint, the St Saint Kilda area. However, like um, other retail and hospitality precincts, uh, the Esplanade, Mar Esplanade market stall holders have been hard hit with the ongoing and rolling lockdowns, especially with the loss of international and interstate customers. Uh, the 2021 financial report reflects the devastating effect of forced closures um, due to COVID restrictions. Um, the lockdowns have also seen the market stall, stall Older numbers reduced by half, which is very unfortunate. And I think we've lost a few um, long-term storeholders as a result of the COVID um, situation. However, with the uh, double vaccination rates um, climbing high, and we've reached that 70% and, and going higher, um, and with the easing of COVID restrictions over the coming weeks, um, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And we all look forward to, to the market resurging um, better than before. I'm hopeful that, hopeful that with uh, the staff engaging with our artisans and uh, emerging designers, that we will see new sellers and a new range of products at the Esplanade market, especially as some approaches. And with everybody keen to buy something special for uh, Christmas for family and friends, and not to forget that special bubble friend. So um, uh, I think it's going to be great for what we'll be seeing down at the Esplanade market in the coming months. So um, yeah, and I'd also like to thank uh, the work um, done by uh, the committee members and the officers for um, enduring uh, these tough times to keep the market and the storeholders informed about um, yeah the what's been going on, especially during lockdown six and bringing them all back on board. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Surikoff. Councillor Martin. The market's a city of Port Phillip institution. There are only, I believe, two councillors who are older than the market, and I'm one of them. I'm not sure who the other one is. Um, so I don't know what our great municipality would be like without the Esplanade market. Councillors Bond and Surikoff. I'll try to get their fly. Oh, Can we might need to put everyone on mute who's not <laughs> speaking. I don't know who that was. Can everyone just make sure they're on mute? And that was Donna D'Alessandro. De Hello, Donna. Um, Hi, Councillor Donna. Martin. So count, councillors Bond and Sirikoff spoke about the work of the committee and the enormous and difficult task they've had, and that, that committee has kept the market going and it's ready to take off again as soon as we get past 80% um, next week. What they failed to mention is that there are two, two council representatives on that board. So can I acknowledge the work of councillors Bond and Sirikoff, uh, without whose efforts perhaps the market may not have survived COVID as well as it's had. So again, commend the motion. What is 
<laughs> All right, thank you very much. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? If not, we'll go back to Councillor Bond to close. No, all right. Let's put that to the vote. Uh, Councillor Bond. Uh, very much for. <laughs> Councillor Clark. For. Councillor Copsey. For. Councillor Crawford. For. Councillor Consolo. For. Councillor Martin. For. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Sirikoff. A big yes. Yeah, and Councillor Baxter. For. That motion is carried unanimously. Thank you, folks. We might take a 10 minute break now. So we're back at 8.26. See you all then. Item 12.2, which is the parklet policy. Councillors, do we have any questions for the officers in regards to this report? If there are no questions, do I have a move up and second for this or something different? Councillor Copsey to move. Do I have a seconder? Anyone jumping? Thank you, Councillor Baxter. Councillor Copsey. I'll just reserve, Mayor. Councillor Baxter. Um, yeah, look, just, just want to note um, how important uh, these parklets have been uh, in trying to, um, you know, help our business community uh, recover uh, from from COVID. Obviously, hasn't been a whole lot of use of them over the the, the past lockdown, but uh, there's going to be an explosion from here. So, um, really good that we're going to have a, a solid policy in place to uh, to manage that and to um, continue to evolve our thinking around how best we can use public space. Um, yes, in a bit of a private way. How much is too much, you know, and and those those sorts of really important questions that we can uh, that we can talk about in supporting our community and our our businesses. Great, Councillor Clark. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Uh, I just wanted to comment on the parklet policy. Or parklets have been uh, very successful through COVID and and well received through the community, and given businesses a, an additional option in what's been pretty tough times. Um, I particularly want to reference the Elwood area um, in my ward, which has seen uh, more challenges with parklets than perhaps the rest of the municipality. And uh, with council officers, we've worked through those issues and it hasn't always been perfect. And there's a lot of uh, differing views in the Elwood community. However, I think this policy is uh, a very good step and a very good I guess, revision or, or permanent policy um, subject to obviously the feedback we get uh, in the journey uh, in terms of uh, establishing the parklets. So I think we've got a good balance. We've had good uh, discussions with council officers and we've been able to come up with a policy that I think um, will work uh, perhaps better or, or work for the Elwood community uh, and, and give everyone um, a fair uh, opportunity, I guess, and uh, clearly it's very popular for the residents as well. So um, I welcome um, the policy and any further feedback and, and working with the whole of the Elwood community regarding um, this policy. So thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bond. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. It's, um, you know, welcome this business parklet policy and business parklet guidelines. Um, I'm sure our businesses will, will take great interest in reading them and will respond accordingly and, and create some great outdoor spaces. It's worth noting item 3.3 .3 there in that we council will be endorsing no fees be charged for parklets for the entire 21-22 financial year. Um, because we in the City of Port Phillip believe in supporting our small businesses to get back on their feet. Um, and it's worth comparing that with other councils across Melbourne who have decided to do differently um, and, and charge for their parklets. And despite having a second opportunity, they doubled down last night and are going to continue to charge their parklets. So uh, we certainly won't be doing that at the City of Port Phillip for this financial year. Um, the other question this uh, parklet policy throws up is what do we do with some of these spaces that have been really, really successful? Do we turn them into per permanent parklets? Um, at the moment, most of our parklets are, are only temporary. Um, and 
one that comes to mind for me is Blessington Street, where we have a whole row of hospitality businesses. Every one of them has activated the area outside their their business to to create a, a space for their customers to enjoy. So we're not going to have the pushback from other um, businesses like we might have in Elwood, where someone parking someone at the outdoor space. We've got a whole area where they all want the outdoor space. Um, it's sent up to council to look at how do we um, make these spaces permanent. What what treatment do we do to these particular spaces in order to um, create the best possible um, place for for not just for these businesses businesses but for our residents um, and for um, visitors to to places like St Kilda. So I look forward to that coming out of this particular uh, parklet policy, whereby we we sit down and analyse a few of our areas and. Um, there's a number of them across the municipality and say, what do we do for the future? How are they going to look in five years' time? You know, do we make them permanent or do we do we take them away? And I think there's certainly opportunities to create some really, really great spaces which will support not just the local business but also create great places for our residents um, to enjoy these local businesses outdoors. So Blessington Street's the one that comes to mind that I'd like to see us start, start and look at and, and perhaps that could be a, a bit of a... A guinea pig for what we do across the rest, and you know, it involves conversations with the traders as to what happens in these particular areas. Um, they won't always all agree. Residents won't always all agree, but it'd be good to to you know, put a put an area through that process, and that can guide us through the rest of the municipality when we, when at some point in time we need to make decisions about what happens to these these spaces long term and what happens to these spaces permanently. But I certainly commend all the work done on this parklet policy and urge my fellow councillors to support it. Thank you. Would any other councillor like to speak to the motion? Councillor Consolo. I've been looking to book something for this weekend and next weekend. The first places I thought of are the ones with the parklets because we really need the outdoor space to fit our big groups that we're trying to get together. So this has been a great initiative that the City of Port Phillip uh, spearheaded and now this policy is trying to make um, so many different versions of it have sense through a policy. So there will be some that don't quite fit, but the officers are great at uh, working through all the details. Um, and I think there's nice additions like planter boxes and things that are nice for our streetscape as well. So appreciate all that the businesses are putting into these spaces and we very much welcome them up in our area. And I know we'll, I will be trying to visit some of the ones down in other areas of the city of Port Phillip this summer too. Would any other councillor like to speak to the motion? All right, we might return to Councillor Copsey to close. Everyone's sick of hearing about COVID silver linings, but here is one uh, that I think we can say has really changed the way that we're um, enjoying outdoor space in our city uh, and probably is something, you know, one of those big upheavals that would not have happened um, had we not had to change and think innovatively about how we use space. So I'm really pleased that we're, we've come to the point um, through what was a pretty involuntary trial at times, but we've had amazing response from our um, business community. We've also had a lot of understanding that these are public spaces um, that are being utilised. And so we've had some really constructive dialogue and beautiful ideas for how the um, built forms and stuff that are put in these um, parklets can be um, really respectful of the fact that it's a public area uh, and also contribute not just to the business but also to our streetscape. I've been really, really heartened by that. I've loved some of the spaces that we've seen through the temporary activations that we've enjoyed and it's fantastic that we're getting to a point now where parklets are part of our landscape going forward and something that we contemplate um, some more specific guidelines around. So. Um, these are some guidance and our officers have done amazing work in being very, very responsive um, to business need and uh, dialogue through this period. I've got full confidence that we've learned some really great things through that process and I'm so glad that we're at a point where we um, can have received all the really great feedback. It's clear that they're much beloved uh, by the community as well and that people are finding this a really positive um, change, I think it's going to be very necessary as well as we readjust to COVID normal and 
find ways that we can still recreate and gosh I know many of us are looking forward to doing that um, over the coming weeks. So really pleased that this policy has come back and uh, very happy to see the guidance provided that will mean that these structures and um, outdoor eating areas are also ones that are enjoyed by our community. Happy to support this tonight. Okay, let's put that to the vote. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Sirikoff. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. And Councillor Bond. Four. That motion is carried unanimously. Now it's item 12.3, which is the South Melbourne Market Annual Report for 2021. Councillors, do we have any questions of the officers in regards to this report? Any questions? If not, do I have a mover and a seconder for this or something different? Councillor Pearl to move. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Copsey. Councillor Pearl. I reserve, Madam Mayor, thanks. Councillor Copsey. I don't need to speak, Madam Mayor, apart to, um, from to, to thank the Market Committee for the report. It's a great read. Would any other councillors like to speak to the motion? Anyone would like to speak to the motion? I'll just briefly put in a few words. It has been a year and a half for the market, really. Uh, and I just want to um, say a huge thank you and a huge uh, and praise the market staff and committee for managing in such a um, agile and I don't want to use the word it's spectacular, but uh, thoughtful and considerate and quick way uh, to the various challenges that have come up on the market. Um, and obviously with COVID closures and, and things like that, there have been challenges be above and beyond what you probably imagined this year would be. And I just want to thank you for the great work in that report and, and to acknowledge that it's been a really tough year for all the traders and to thank the committee for their hard work, um, some of the big picture thinking that's been happening. Um, and obviously, uh, a small operating uh, profit in, in a year like this is just impressive. So I really look forward to what's possible for the market and some of the upgrades and things like that that will come in the next financial year. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? Well, let's go back to Councillor Pearl. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you also to Councillor, well, former Councillor Bernadine Voss, who was also on the committee. Um, through a small part of this period that's covered in the report. So it, it's been a big year in the in the market. Obviously, I, um, Councillor Consolo and myself have the privilege and the honour to represent um, Council as the councillors on the committee for the um, for the South Melbourne market. And it, it, whilst it's been a difficult year, it's been a, a tale of two stories. It's been a hugely innovative and prosperous year for many traders in the South Melbourne market. And then there's others that have just been particularly in the general merchandise area, completely hamstrung by a number of things, not being able to open their stores um, and also the supply chain issues that we're facing. But ultimately, like many businesses and um, community groups and organisations, the market will come out of this experience stronger, better um, and uh, more resilient into the future. And that, 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 that's a positive thing. But that only happens with the uh, dedication and, and good decision making of the people involved in the market. And that's um, it needs to be acknowledged that Danielle, the general manager of the market, is an exceptional leader of her people um, and, a, and a good leader of the overall business that's going on there at the market at the moment. The report in front of you that's been tabled here tonight, councillors, is, is very detailed that gives you the update of what's happened over the past 12 months. So I don't need to uh, read to you or even highlight what's happened. Um, what I would say is what this report does is shows you the positioning of the market for the next two or three years. Um, uh, the mayor mentioned some of the larger strategic planning initiatives that have been going on, which are which, which are welcomed and will be considered by council. But the um, rubber is also hitting the road, particularly on the compliance works, which has been many years in the making, uh, and also making sure that we're constantly evolving and ensuring that the retail mix uh, is right in the market and the the flavour of the traders we have in the market also meets the demand of the local community as well as the broader community that use this as their their local gathering place, particularly on the weekend. So. 
um, again, thank you for the honour and the privilege to be your representative on the South Melbourne market. I appreciate that very, very much, councillors, and very happy to um, provide you uh, the annual report this evening and um, commend it to you. All right, let's put that to the vote and uh, division. Councillor Coxey? Four. Councillor Crawford? Four. Councillor Consolo? Four. Councillor Martin? Four. Councillor Pearl? In favour. Councillor Sirikov? Four. Councillor Baxter? Four. Councillor Bond? Four. And Councillor Clark? Four. The motion is carried unanimously. Uh, moving on to 13.3, which is the Stokehouse Precinct additional support. Councillors, we have a report. Do we have any questions for the officers? Any questions for the officers? Councillor Martin. My, my question, Mayor, is concerning the... Yeah, I, I understand that there are some issues and then we're looking at supporting a number of our local traders and in particular the Stokehouse because it's a very close relationship and I'm not averse to doing that. But are we able from our council officers to have an indication as to whether the quarterly budget review next year will allow us to have the funds to do this? Because if, if we're able to do it, it sounds like a worthwhile proposition, but are we, are we likely to be looking at a range of different uh, proposals competing for money or is this something we'll be able to manage? Uh, is that Rod Pringle that I'll go to or Chris Carroll? Uh, Chris Carroll for this part. Um, Rod, very well equipped to give you the details, um, but I'll talk about the budget. Yeah, look, there, there is... Um, thank you, Councillor. There is um, a range of competing budget pressures on Council, as you're, as you're aware. Um, you did have the CEO report tonight that talked about, talk about our financial position, um, which had deteriorated somewhat because of... Um, COVID and parking revenue, although we had made some savings to offset some of that as well. Uh, and the council also made a uh, decision earlier in the year to provide an additional two and a half million in support for, for businesses, including the Stokehouse as part of our commercial um, tenancy support scheme. Um, this is a request over and above that for good reason, as outlined in the report. Um, but there is other, other parts of what the Stokehouse has requested around supporting some of the changes to their lease, which we recommend. Um, you may wish to defer the decision around the financials to the um, quarterly budget review, which is coming on the 3rd of November. So you can see this against the council's overall financial position and the other um, competing um, ideas that are coming up. But if, if, if the council did have the money, obviously the officers in this case are recommending something is worthwhile to consider. Is a special case in terms of level of investment that the stake house has made in the building, um, significant more so than, than many, if not all other um, tenants, apart from potentially the Palais Live Nation. Um, and, uh, you know, very early in their lease term, it's, it's, it's hit them hard. So something worthwhile considering, but you may want to do that alongside your um, quarterly budget review. Are there any other questions? Uh, councillors, we have an officer's recommendation. Do I have a mover for this or something different? And I will put my hand up. I'm going to move an alt rec. If we could pop that on the screen while I get it up in front of me or maybe on screen. Um, so just to, to read out the adjustment. So at 3.4 that we're instead of approving, we're noting that additional financial support requested uh, by Stoke House, proprietary limited to assist in the recovery from coronavirus pandemic, will be considered by council as part of the quarterly budget or quarter, second quarter budget review in November 2021. And then we're removing 3.4.1 and 3.4.2. Uh, and then remainder that 3.5 remains the same. And that's the extent of the um, the alt rec is slightly different. Do I have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Martin, thank you. So we know how valued the Stoke House is um, to the St Kilda foreshore and to the broader community. Um, it stands as a, a significant building, and I know the significant investment and, and the kind of. Um, huge hospitality cred that it adds to our municipality. Um, 
One of the challenges just with this motion as it's structured is that we are about to have a quarterly budget review and we know that there are many things to um, consider. So until we have that information, um, it's not as easy to make a, an informed decision just in the timing of this. However, I'm very supportive, obviously, in this motion that uh, the uh, lease, uh, amended lease, um, or the, the lease requirements, I am very supportive of because I understand the huge investment in this building and the long-term commitment that the Stoke House has to our area. And uh, so I'm happy totally to take those on board, but I do know that we need to have more information before we are able to make a, a, a a decision around financial financial support, and that information will not be with us until for the next until the next week or so. So I hope that councillors will support it, that we will be um, considering the financial relief, but just a little bit later than this week. But at the moment, we are focusing on that the um, the, the amendments to the lease uh, be considered. So I will ask you to support this for consideration of uh, both requests, but in sort of two parts now. Councillor Martin. Thank you, Mayor. I believe the uh, the extensions to the lease, that this is a no brainer. The Stoke House has struggled over the last two years and the very least we can do is to extend the lease as has been put forward in the motion. I'd also hope we're in a position to provide additional financial relief in the short term as well. However, as I mentioned, when I spoke in favour of the um, CEO's report, we've got a $4.6 million increase in our cash deficit above what our predicted position was three months ago. And when we get our quarterly review next week, we can see how this request sits alongside everyone, every, all the others. I'm hoping we'll be in a position to endorse the rest of the request as set out in the additional motion, but I don't believe it would be financially responsible for us to make that decision until we saw what our current financial position was. So, Happy to commend the amended motion or the alt rec, I should say. Uh, do I have any other councillors wishing to speak to the motion? No? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, sorry. Oh, yeah, Councillor Clark. Um, so I, um, I think given the COVID situation that uh, we've all gone through, businesses particularly, and I know there's been a lot of challenges down on the foreshore, um, for those those businesses there, um, I think um, it's only incumbent upon us to provide uh, the support that we can uh, for the Stoke House. I'm happy to support the extended uh, leasing requirements, but I also don't see proportional rent relief given the rent the relief that we provided to many businesses across the community uh, through COVID, as well as other waivers of of rates and various other things. Uh, I don't think 80,000, 85,000 is a huge amount to be able to um, provide to the Stokehouse Group, which as mentioned in the recommendation, has got three different restaurants which have all been hit, a huge number of staff. Um, and so I'm not supportive of this motion. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion, Councillor Bond? Um, yeah, I'm also not supportive of this motion. I think we have enough information before us um, to, to make this decision tonight. Um, very supportive of the, the lease extension because I know it costs us nothing really, but it is highly valuable to the, to the Stoke House in their current circumstances when it comes to finance and other um, elements of their business that they're trying to juggle. Um, in the event this motion fails, I'd like to foreshadow that I'll move the original officer's recommendation. Anyone else have to speak to the motion? No? Uh, and then it's on me to close. There is not, um, I just want to clarify, this is not about me not wanting to support the Stoke House. I just thought it was, uh, I am just of the opinion that in we need to look at all of the various um, challenges financially that are, are um, that will be highlighted in the quarterly review, and it would be more prudent, as we always talk about um, financial prudency and sustainability, to have a little bit more information before um, committing ourselves to this decision. So let's put that to the vote, uh, Councillor Martin. For. Councillor Pearl. For. Councillor Sirikoff. For. Councillor Baxter. For. 
Councillor Bond. Against. Councillor Clark. Against. Councillor Copsey. For. Councillor Crawford. For. And Councillor Consolo. For. The motion is carried. Uh, so moving along, then we are going to do an items on block. Um, so that being the case, we have got uh, an on block section, and that's reports 10.1, 10.2, 11.1, 13.1, 13.2, 13.4, 13.5, 13.6, 13.7. Okay, so do I have a mover, Councillor Pearl, and do I have a seconder? All oh, right, Councillor Martin. So we're not going to speak to this one. We are just going to take it to the vote. So Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Sirikoff. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. The motion is carried. So item 14 is notices of motion and we have no notices of motion on tonight's agenda. So 15 is reports of councillor delegates. Councillors, do we have any reports from councillor delegates? Councillor Martin. I'll be very brief, Madam Mayor. Um, today, Councillor Copsey and I commenced the process of interviewing potential applicants for our I keep getting the acronym right, LGTB, I've left LGBT out LGBTIQ+. IQ plus. IQ plus. The calibre of the applicants has been absolutely outstanding and I'm sure that when we get this committee together, when we can decide on who the final nominees are, it's going to be an outstanding group. So I don't know whether Councillor Cops would like to echo my comments, but it's been an absolute delight to interview these people. As I say, the calibre is absolutely outstanding. This is going to be a wonderful advisory committee of our council. Thank you. And Councillor Baxter? Thanks, Madam Mayor. Uh, yeah, as um, Council's delegate to the Municipal Association in Victoria, um, I'll just report that uh, a couple of things. A, um, the next uh, State Council of the MAV has been uh, cancelled um, due to you know, not being able to meet and, and those sorts of things and the, um, and the MAV rules not allowing a, a digital meeting such as we're having uh, now. So that'll be put off until uh, the next one uh, early next year. Um, but uh, I have been uh, in contact with the other uh, inner metro uh, or metro central um, uh, MAV delegates to, to discuss some of the some of the issues that we have uh, come across as as similar councils, um, in particular uh, discussion around um, sex work decriminalisation and the uh, and the planning mechanisms and changes that that would make for for council has been something that. Um, uh, has a um, that that other councils have recognised um, Port Phillip's leadership on, um, in terms of our our deep uh, understanding of of the matter and the and the, and the stakeholders and the uh, mechanisms involved, um, but also uh, has informed uh, to an extent the MAV's uh, position on the uh, on the rollout of that decriminalisation. Thank you. Would anyone other councillor delegates? No. Okay, councillors, for item 16, do you have any items of urgent business that I'm unaware of? Great. Uh, 17 is confidential matters. Now, councillors, we do have one confidential item on tonight's agenda being 17.1, which is the St Kilda Marina sublease arrangements. So we're going to close the meeting to the public. I now call on a councillor to move that the meeting be closed to members of the public to consider this confidential item. Thank you, Councillor Martin and Councillor Pearl to second. I'll put that motion under division. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Councillor Martin. Four. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Pearl. In favour. And Councillor Sterikoff. Four. That motion is carried. So, councillors, we now conclude the open part of this meeting in WebEx and we'll move to Microsoft Teams to consider the confidential item. I um, advise members of the public, thank you for playing along tonight and that there are no further open, open items to be discussed. So that will be the conclusion of this public meeting and thank you for joining us tonight. And it's an early mark for you and a also early mark for us. 
All right, everyone, see you on Teams.